quick. Think of a pre-Columbian American civilization of pyramid builders that performed human sacrifices and mapped out the stars. Unless you cheated and looked at the video title, you probably thought of the Aztecs or the Mayas. But today, we're talking about another stargazing, people-sacrificing, triangle-obsessed group, the Cahokians. Almost a thousand years ago, what is now St. Louis was home to the city of Cahokia. At its peak, the city and its surrounding farmlands were home to an estimated 40,000 inhabitants, which puts it on par with contemporary London. Its influence spread far and wide across the continent, with Cahokian products found from Wisconsin and Minnesota to Oklahoma and Louisiana. At the turn of the first millennium, the floodplain of the Mississippi River, known as the American Bottom, was dotted by many small tribal villages, each counting less than a thousand inhabitants. Around 1050, something happened that caused them to band together and create the large and sprawling city of Cahokia. It is entirely unclear what kickstarted this development. Perhaps the inhabitants of the many villages banded together under a charismatic leader or a fearsome warlord. Maybe some religious event, possibly linked to the supernova of 1054, inspired them to create something larger than themselves. Or maybe they just naturally grew closer over time through trade and cooperation. One piece of evidence that makes the mystery of Cahokia's origin even more complicated are the Raimi knives. These are a style of knives that were seemingly mass produced by the Cahokians. While these knives have little to no resemblance to other tools made in the area before the rise of the city, they share a striking similarity with those used in Mesoamerica. This might indicate that the city's founding was influenced by, or done in response to, foreign traders or travelers. Whatever the reason for its creation was, it's clear that it was not just some coincidence. The construction of the city was meticulously planned. Old towns were raised to the ground, and the new project was built on top of it. This was all done in an astonishingly small amount of time. The old way of life was seemingly replaced overnight. This project must have taken an incredible amount of manpower and coordination, showing that most of the area's inhabitants were behind it. Soon after its creation, the city began to attract immigrants from all over the continent. The city itself was built around the central Grand Plaza and a large pyramid. The rest of the city was divided into smaller neighborhoods, each built around its own small community plazas and perhaps containing one or more small mounds. These civilian houses all followed a similar template. Their walls were made from wooden posts set vertically into the ground, with earth heaped against their exteriors. On top, they had roofs made of golden thatch. The floors were below the surface to help regulate temperature. A large ceremonial road, known as the Rattlesnake Causeway, connects the central precinct to another large ceremonial complex known as Rattlesnake Mount, named for the large amount of rattlesnakes found there. This road, as well as the rest of the city's grid, follows an offset of 5 degrees east of north. This is thought to mirror the southern lunastice which is 5 degrees west of north. The dense city core was surrounded by smaller villages and farmsteads, which provided food and other resources to the inhabitants. The city's most iconic feature was a large central pyramid known as Monk's Mount. This structure is the largest man-made mount of North America, coming in at almost 30 meters or 100 feet tall. The mount had a flat top on which a large building was located. This is speculated to have been the residence of the city's leader. It had three other terraces containing temples, council chambers, storage rooms, and living quarters for the palatial servants. From the top of the hill, the Cahokian elite could keep an eye over the entire cityscape unfolding beneath them. To the south of this great palatial complex was a large flat area measuring almost 500 meters in length and 270 meters in width, now known as the Grand Plaza. It played host to many ceremonial gatherings, as well as to America's favorite pastime, Chunky. Chunky was a sport played throughout Mississippian civilization and their successors. It involved rolling disc-shaped stones over an open plaza and throwing spears at it. Competitors are awarded points for hitting the stone as it is rolling, or letting their spears as close to its final resting place as possible. To the Cahokians, Shanky was far more than just a sport. It had many ceremonial and political implications. Rival factions might settle their disputes through Chunky instead of violence, which helped keep the peace. Losing such a game could ruin your reputation or social standing. Besides this political dimension, Chunky was also popular among gamblers. People were known to bet everything, including the clothes on their back, their spouse, or in extreme cases, even their freedom. Besides Monk's Mount, the city contained an estimated 200 other mounds. These can be split into three categories. Flat top mounds, which contained buildings such as temples on top. Round top mounds, which were often used for burials and rich top mounds, which served several purposes including burials and seemingly indicated the border between different districts of the city. One of the more archaeologically relevant of these is Mount 72. This is a burial site dedicated to two individuals, one man and one woman. 
The man, who is assumed to be an important Cahokian ruler, was buried on a bed of 20,000 shell beads spread out in the form of a falcon. This birdman was buried with a large number of grave goods, such as arrowheads, exotic minerals, and a number of chunky stones. Buried along with these two individuals were several servants and retainers. The mound also contained almost 250 other skeletons buried at later stages. These are believed to have been the victim of human sacrifice. This burial is noteworthy for several reasons. The arrowheads hail from all over the North American continent, indicating how far the Cahokian trade network spread. This is further corroborated by Cahokian trade goods appearing in sites as far as Louisiana and Minnesota. The ceremonial burial of this king, along with his many possessions, contrasted with the human sacrifice victims, points to a large amount of social inequality within the city. Some of the sacrifices were shown to have a poor diet, consisting of mostly corn and low quality meats, and they are theorized to have been chosen from the poorer farmers of the outer regions of Cahokia. The burial itself must have been a large public event, perhaps intended to inspire all in the city's inhabitants, or foster a sense of community by honoring its former leaders. This is not the only instance of such political theater in the city. The previously mentioned Rattlesnake Mound contains a burial theorized to have been an instance of an entire high-class family being ceremoniously sacrificed. This served the purpose of both getting rid of a political rival, while also potentially winning over the populace through such a grand spectacle. The falcon chain pattern on which the man was buried is likely a reference to an important figure in local mythology, the Birdman. Birdman or falcon imagery is found throughout Mississippian sites. While the exact details of the Mississippian interpretation of this figure are unclear, his story is thought to have survived as the hero named Redhorn from Suan speaking traditions. Redhorn is known by many names, such as he who wears human hats as earrings because, well, he wore human hats as earrings, or as he who is hit with deer lungs because his brothers are assholes. He was ascribed several supernatural abilities. He was said to have the ability to turn into an arrow, and he could change the lock of his hair into a long red horn, hence his name. In one of his most famous adventures, Redhorn and his friends, a turtle who can move unusually fast and a falcon named Storm as he walks, are challenged to a series of high stake contests, including a game of Chunky, by a group of giants. The loser of the contest would be put to death. Redhorn and his team won, in part because the giant star player kept laughing at Redhorn's earpieces. Afterward, all but one of the giants were killed. Redhorn spared the life of a red-haired giantess, who he took as a bride. In a later adventure, Redhorn and his friends lose another similar contest and are put to death, their heads displayed on pikes around the giant's village. Before his death, his two wives, a red-haired giant and a human named Girl with a White Beaver Skin as a rep, bore him two sons. The first one took after his father and had human faces on his earlobes, while the other had human faces on his nipples. These children took back the skulls of their father and his friends and managed to return them back to life. In reward, they received some superpowered weapons. Besides Redhorn and his associates, another important figure in Cahokian mythology appears to be a woman named Corn Mother, said to be responsible for the origin of corn. Unsurprisingly, statues believed to depict her were often found in the farmsteads surrounding the city. Another Cahokian site that might shine some light on their beliefs is Woodhenge. This site, named after the British Stonehenge, consists of a group of large wooden upright posts positioned in a series of circular formations. The posts were made of red cedar wood, which is considered sacred by many Native American cultures and might indicate a ceremonial or monumental purpose. This theory is further supported by the fact that the stylized depiction of the monument is carved into ceremonial beakers. Like everything else about the city, its orientation was thought out in great detail. The circle is believed to be a solar calendar, marking the solstice and equinox. When standing in the center of the circle during the equinox, the sun appears to rise from the top of Monk's Mount, which is located roughly half a mile east of the site. Similarly, the winter solstice sunrise aligns with the landmark called Fox Mount. But perhaps the biggest mystery surrounding the city is not about its origins, or what life in the city was like, but about how and why it was abandoned. The city's population started to decline in the 13th century, and by 1350 it was left completely empty. The reasons for this are unclear. Many theories focus on environmental factors leading to the city's eventual demise. One popular theory, called the deforestation hypothesis, states that continuous chopping of wood in the area led to more erosion and eventually flooding. For a while, this was the most widely accepted theory, until a recent study showed that there is no evidence of flooding during this period. Another environmental hypothesis focuses on a major drought that is believed to have hit the area during the depopulation. This could have caused widespread crop failure and famine. Other theories focus on the more human aspects. In the late 12th and early 13th century, 
the Cahokians built a series of walls and fortifications around the city to provide protection. This means that during this time, war and conflict were a real threat to the city's inhabitants. This could indicate that the city was abandoned following a war or internal conflict. We've also seen already that there was a lot of inequality within the population. Perhaps the poorer citizens simply left and relocated as soon as any cracks started to show, leaving the rich unable to support themselves. Throughout this video, you might have noticed that there are very few things about the city that we know for certain. Everything we know, we found out through archaeological finds and through comparing them with traditions of other native groups. This is made more difficult by the fact that several highways, farms and modern neighborhoods are built on large parts of the former city. In fact, a lot of archaeological digs performed were salvage digs made in preparation for the creation of the I-55 and 70 highways. We have had to rely on archaeology because there are no local oral traditions about the city. But isn't that weird? You would think that the city of that size would have left some sort of cultural or social impact on its inhabitants and its neighbors. But not only is there no oral record of this, no other project of a similar size was ever even attempted. And the area in which the city was located was completely abandoned for centuries after, earning the nickname the Vacant Quadrant. This is despite the fertile lands on which it was built. This might indicate that, whatever happened to cause the city to disappear, its former inhabitants wanted to forget about it as quickly as possible perhaps treating it as some sort of failed experiment. Thank you for watching, I've been Thomas, and I hope to see you in the next video, where I'll find a solution to world peace. Hiya.